Good afternoon, space flight enthusiasts, and also I hope some UFO enthusiasts as well, because this is a topic that should really, really interest everybody. Because a lot of people will ask, and I get asked on a regular basis, why spend billions and billions of dollars just to put some rich space tourists into orbit or to the moon or wherever? What is the benefit to the average person? And even NASA is hard-pressed to explain this a lot of the time. They'll talk about all the technological spin-offs and the different technological innovations that save lives that have come about as the result of the space program, but sometimes it's difficult to make a direct connection between those developments. Could these devices not have been invented without the space program if we just had programs dedicated to these types of innovations rather than this roundabout method spending all this money to invent these useful devices seems to be sort of an inefficient way to do it. Well, what NASA doesn't talk about, not nearly enough, and really I would say that many who advocate for space don't always understand the enormous benefits that can be delivered to the average human being on this planet, no matter where they are, by the products, materials, and especially the pharmaceuticals that can be developed exclusively in a microgravity environment. There are a variety of different types of chemical compounds that are almost impossible to assemble properly when you have a full G of gravity pulling down on them. They end up in a puddle at the bottom of a Petri dish. This also especially applies to things like 3D printing, printing replacement organs so that organ procurement becomes a thing of the past. These are all things that can be done as a result of the space industry. And so that is why I have the title that I do on this particular thumbnail. Because yes, what Varda Space Industries is doing, the company that I interviewed at IAC and that I've been reporting on for some time now, is something that could definitely save your life. As a matter of fact, if you are likely to develop a variety of different conditions that end people's lives prematurely, whether it be cancer, heart disease, a whole huge slew of different things, all of these diseases can be treated better by the types of medications that can be developed in microgravity. And Varda is spearheading this effort right now. And I got the opportunity to learn more about their intriguing method that they're using, a much less expensive method than the idea of sending it up to overworked astronauts on the International Space Station at an enormous cost. There are other ways to manufacture these pharmaceuticals in orbit. And as I say, there's a very good chance that these new bleeding edge medications will save your life eventually. <laughs> Folks, still here at IAC, just getting, getting one interview after the next lately, but let me tell you something. This is the one that I've been looking forward to, Varda. And uh, so would you be so kind, first of all, sir, to introduce yourself to the viewers? Sure. Um, hey, everyone. My name's Eric Lasker. I'm the Chief Revenue Officer and part of the founding team at uh, Varda Space Industries. Once again, really appreciate the time you're giving us today. So first of all, Tell us a little bit about what's behind us, and the viewers are looking at this right now as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so what's right behind us, if you can see us, here I can grab this too if that's easier for you. Um, this is the W3 capsule, so the Winnebago series capsule. So these are uh, the, the first vehicles that we have uh, flown to space for pharmaceutical production in microgravity. And so, uh, yeah, this is the, the real deal here. Uh, this landed in the uh, Australian Outback um, back in May of this year. Um, and we've got another in space. And so, yeah, I mean, that's why it looks a little charred and kind of bumped up a little bit is that, yeah, parachute landing uh, just a few months ago and then back to L.A. and then back down here for IAC. Now, of course, it's always a magical thing to see something that's been to space and back. Yeah. 
tell us a little bit about how, how people have been reacting to it, first of all. What has been the, the public's reaction to having this thing here? Uh, yeah, I mean, r really strong. I think that we, the team's been um, getting the question a lot. Is this the real object that was in space? And I don't know. If we had to go paint it to make it look uh, this real, that probably would have almost cost as much as actually sending one to space and getting it back down. So, uh, yeah, it's, it, it's been really positive. And yes, this is the real uh, vehicle right behind us. And yeah, I, I, I'm pretty proud that I think we're the only piece of flown space hardware on the floor here but most people don't get them back and we have the good fortune of, of getting them back that's amazing so tell me this i mean in terms of just explain to the viewers why is it that microgravity is an environment that is conducive to the manufacture of certain types of pharmaceuticals why can't we do that in a full g yeah it's a, it's a great question so there, there's kind of two pieces of this or, or let's say three so first you know the conditions of microgravity cannot be replicated um uh on earth um if we you know if we figured out how to make anti-gravity devices uh, on Earth, then we wouldn't go through this hassle of actually going to space because that's where you can get true sustained microgravity. Um, and when I say sustained, that's that's an important piece of the puzzle here, right? Because you've probably seen those uh, vomit comets, they're called, zero-G flights. You get a small piece of microgravity, right? For 10, 15, 20 seconds. And most of the reactions that we um, are interested in um, and, and have frankly been proven um, up on the International Space Station and even going back to uh, the space shuttle missions and Skylab, you need sustained microgravity on the orders of hours, if not days. Um, and so you can really only get that by being um, in low Earth orbit. And so that's kind of the, the first piece to put over there. The second piece to kind of build the story is that humanity and people have known that going to space has been conducive to make uh, improved materials really going all the way back to the earliest days um, of, of the space industry. The, the challenge has just been that it's been so damn expensive to get up there and so infrequent that yes, we have known that there is there, there's uh, economic value of going to space for materials, but it's just not been conducive to something that you're going to go put in the supply chain. Right. It's if, if you had a factory that was wildly expensive to get to and oh, by the way, you could only get to like once or twice a year. Obviously, you would just go work on other things until the supply chain and, and that all developed. And so microgravity only in space, that other problem really getting worked on with reusable rockets, say SpaceX bringing uh, the cost of getting to orbit uh, down quite a bit, but also just the frequency going up allowed for a company like Varda to be started just around four years ago, where we can look at that research um, that's been uh, uh, done in, in microgravity and, and try to bring that to market, right? And so that gets us over to uh, the pharmaceutical side, which again, in the most simplistic terms, the way to think about the improvements that happen um, in microgravity is just Think of, um, I don't know, maybe like a lava lamp, right? Where you've got uh, cold going down, hot going up, and you get this, what's known as a buoyancy driven convective current. And so if you zoom in um, to any sort of pharmaceutical reaction, at some point, you're going to need to take that medicine at a molecular state and get it into a packaging or a formulation that enters your body, right? So that's how you go from something that it is a molecule that, that cures a disease or, or helps with some kind of ailment, but you need to have it process in somebody's body. And that all has to do with the crystalline structure, kind of how that molecule is packaged into it itself. And so in a 1G environment, you can think about that lava lamp example of these molecules kind of bumping into each other um, in, a, in a fairly disordered way. And that has some real macroscopic effects on how that medicine is able to get into your body. And you just don't have that effect in microgravity, right? And so um, there, there are papers that, that NASA has been publishing for quite some time that just shows you in this very, very still environment, you can take in the canonical example is something from, let's say that would be administered in an IV or an intravenous over the course of hours and actually be able to put it into something that's a shot or maybe even a pill. And so that has real benefits to patient populations. Um, and, and that's the type of, of value that, that microgravity has been known um, to be able to uh, uh, influence for quite some time. And again, VART is building that infrastructure and advancing the science so then we can bring that to market. Thank you, uh, and I can I can feel your passion about the about the topic and and about the the uh, the discipline of trying to do this. Now, let's differentiate this from a space station manufacture. Instead of putting this in the hands of an astronaut on the ISS, where's the advantage of a satellite doing it instead? Yeah, so um, that's a, that's a good point. You're not going to fit an astronaut into <laughs> into the the W series vehicles back here. Um, look. Uh, to put it simply, um, we can get to higher cadence and at lower cost than if you put an astronaut in the loop. I mean, if you have a if you have a human in orbit, you need to think about all of the other 
pieces of survival equipment, let's call them, or comfort <laughs> to bring an astronaut up to bring an astronaut up there. And so when we're thinking about producing something of economic viability, let's say, in microgravity, we really need to think about how do we get the cost as low as possible so then when somebody wants to manufacture something in space, it is really just about that piece of manufacturing and, and nothing else. And so, you know, we strip out the, the cushioned seat that the astronauts need to ride up on, we strip out the life support system, and by doing so, we can just drive the cost down to actually perform that work. And so look, there will always be a role for astronauts to play, let's say, in very early stage research, even in some of the more, um, uh, certainly over on the, the human research side of things, being how people survive in space. But if there's, a, if there's a path to get humans out of the loop, either on the research itself or certainly on the production side, that just makes it more economically viable. And so that's the approach that we've taken with these vehicles. Fantastic, so let's talk about the future. We have number four in orbit around us right now, is that correct? So, I mean, what's going on on that particular mission and what do you have coming up? Are you looking at upscaling what you have here? Yeah, great question. Yeah, uh, so W4 is is orbiting right now. Um, we'll bring that down in the next uh, month or so. So that vehicle is a is a what we call in the industry as a block upgrade of the vehicle itself. So same capsule, uh, but we're doing quite a bit more on the satellite bus, kind of the control piece of the satellite itself. And so that's going through a battery of tests. That's why that one's hanging out there, uh, up there just a little bit longer than this guy that was only in orbit for about a month and a half or so. Um, and so when we bring that down, that will really unlock an ability to scale up. Our uh, 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 creation of these vehicles just that much more. And so this was a, a, a big, more internal step than maybe what it looks like from the outside and our ability to really scale this up. And so, you know, thinking about future vehicles, it's been kind of an interesting uh, uh, path of discovery for, for us over at Varda. We had anticipated a real demand for, for larger vehicles, um, say in the next year or so, and we have some napkin sketches of what that might look like. I think where we've really seen the market go is that the, the it seems like a lot more of these. So actually scaling in a different direction as opposed to just larger and larger vehicles where you really have to think about, okay, how do we optimize the space and make sure that we just fill it up to the gills? It's really more about just how many can we send up and come down, grab the microgravity, come back down, grab the microgravity, come back down. And so I think where you're going to see Varda actually expanding, and this was actually part of our announcement yesterday, is just more frequent missions of this variety. Um, and then sure, once we crack the code and we know we need to go make, I don't know, 100 tons of some pharmaceutical, yes, I am not concerned. Our team will be able to put together a bigger vehicle, but really we're in the, call it the mid innings of this industry actually coming to fruition and it's pointing us more into just that frequency argument more than the scale, more than the, sorry, not scale, uh, volume argument, let's say. Two more questions and then we'll be done. First of all, and I'm, I'm sure there's probably a lot you can't talk about with this, so we'll address what I think maybe you can talk about. The FAA left this, your first satellite in orbit for eight months until you could eventually bring it back down. Um, and then you, our friends at Southern Launch seem to have provided a solution. Can you tell us just really briefly about that process? How did this end up happening to where you found a solution here in Australia? Yeah, absolutely. Um, look. We are doing something completely novel for the space industry and certainly novel for the US and, and all countries involved, right? Like uh, uh, re-entry capabilities have been uh, in the purview of governments and or oceanic re-entries, uh, you know, landing things in the ocean. And, you know, we, we determined that we need to land this on land in order to make the turnaround time for orbitally manufactured goods to be viable, right? Um, if we're out bobbing around in the ocean every single time, it, it, it just wasn't viable. Um, and so with that though, we had to do a lot of very new things with the regulators, right? We, we were bringing a spacecraft back into rather congested US airspace just west of Salt Lake City on a military range. Um, that even when I say it out loud, the idea that that was ever going to be a scalable solution it, it's just it, it, it's just not possible, right? Those military ranges have other priorities. Um, we knew as the market was demanding that we get this uh, scaled operations up, and when I say scale, I truly just mean lots and lots of these vehicles going. Um, through that process of, of working through the challenges with W1, we pretty quickly started looking for partners that might want to help us get to the scale of operations um, that, that we knew were in our future. And so, look, Australia has a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of great ranges, great land, but more than anything, really just a want to do this. This is the easiest thing in the world to say no to, right? Like, can we come uh, bring a lot of uh, 
high velocity re-entry vehicles and, and put them down in the desert and we're still a bit of a younger company. And so, but really what we saw with the partnership down at Southern Launch and also the regulators down in Australia was just a real want to bring this to uh, Australia. And um, we've had a great partnership to date and we're continuing to expand that. So we're excited about it. I can see why you would be. Yeah, definitely. Last question, and this is probably the most sensitive of all. Uh, my friends at Southern Launch suggested that there might be the possibility of having a conversation about me covering the re-entry of number four. Is this a conversation we can have in the future? We can absolutely have that conversation. It's actually, you know, how far out into the Southern Launch range that you actually want to get out there, but I'm sure that we can uh, figure something out there. And yeah, uh, you know, W2 is a nighttime reentry too, and I'm pretty jealous of a lot of the team that were able to stand at Southern Launch and actually see the shooting star of the W Series capsule come down. Um, and so, yeah, happy to have that. Fantastic. Thanks very much. Thanks so much. It continues to confound me as to why NASA, why space advocates don't talk more about this. Because in my opinion, when it comes to the lives of everyday people here on Earth, these sorts of developments are by far the most important. Most people are never going to experience the benefit of, of these new types of spinoff technologies um, that are created as a result of the space program. Or even if they do, there's no way to, to guarantee that these technologies might have been invented in some other way. But when we're talking about medications that can only be built in microgravity, that can only be synthesized in this unique environment, there's no other way to do it. There's no other environment where these medications can be synthesized and produced. Now, of course, this is on a very small scale right now with Varda's current satellites, but as it becomes more and more successful and as Varda becomes more and more profitable as a result of what they're doing, let me tell you, this can turn into a multi-billion dollar industry, perhaps even a trillion dollar industry, given how many of us have to make use of pharmaceuticals in order to survive. And it's high time that NASA and ESA and other spaceflight organizations, together with those who advocate for them, explain this to the public, because almost nobody understands this right now. Very few people understand the kind of immediate and practical benefit that space can bring. And as I said in the interview, Varda is spearheading all of this. They should be applauded for it, and I certainly hope that they are successful. I'm frustrated that the FAA has put so many stumbling blocks in front of these folks, given the importance of what they're working on here. Certainly more important, in my opinion, than Starship delivering colonists to the Martian surface. Sure, I think making life multiplanetary ultimately will be very beneficial to the human species, but until that time, these are real life benefits that will help us now and something that should be talked about a lot more frequently. So please share this video. Please share this information. I don't usually say this on my videos, but in this case, I really want people to know about this. Thanks very much for watching. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. And until next time, stay angry about space.